Probably the main point of this story, and why it was included in King Saul's narrative, is to show how truly far he had sunken. At one point, King Saul is depicted in a dead faint of hunger and weakness and terror, with the Witch of Endor stooping over him, urging him to get up and eat. The juxtapositions are striking. The king of all Israel, cowering in terror, while a lowly subject tries to help him up. Someone who was once anointed by God, who had once prophesied while swept up in the spirit, now consulting a spiritist in direct violation of God's express command. A tall and well-built man, now led by a woman, who most likely was not even an Israelite. Still, on second and third read, there are intriguing possibilities and perplexing questions. So first we'll look at spiritism. What is it and what place did it have in God's kingdom? Then we'll look at Saul's downward spiral and we'll land on the spirit of love. In the ancient Near East, sorcerers and mediums and spiritists were seen as wise and their craft as powerful and professional, and they were known for their enchantments and their spells. In antiquity, as well as today, they were also called upon to communicate with the spirit world. And there are basically three varieties of spiritual beings as described in the Bible. One kind of spirit would be what we would call today angelic beings. They're described throughout scripture as powerful servants of God, even sometimes called the sons of God, who at regular intervals interact with people on God's behalf. The second kind of spirit is God's Holy Spirit, unique of the same substance as Almighty God because the Holy Spirit is God. And finally, there is a third kind of spirit, evil spirits. These are angelic beings who rejected the Lord and now oppose God. And chief among those spirits is one called Satan, meaning adversary, also called the lying serpent or the serpent of old, and sometimes referred to as the devil. Mediums or spiritists, as they were sometimes called, with the help of these evil spirits, would attempt to contact those who had died as well as ask the spirits for information concerning the future, ferret out secrets. Kings would ask sorcerers sometimes to find intelligence on enemy armies' movements and tactics and predict which way battles would go. One such sorcerer was Balaam, whose story is told in the Book of Numbers. He positioned himself as a prophet for hire, and he was employed by a Canaanite king to curse the Israelite armies. But as God intervened, Israel was blessed instead. Witches of ancient Sumeria and Babylonia invented an elaborate theory about demons, their demonology, if you will. And they believed the world was full of spirits and that most of these spirits were hostile. And they were pretty much right, at least in terms of the kinds of spirits they were interacting with. And according to their theory, each person was supposed to have their own spirit demon, which would protect them from other demons and enemies, which could only be fought by the use of magic which included amulets and incantations and exorcisms. Ancient Egypt had a great influence on the Canaanite people groups because Canaan was part of Egypt's empire for centuries. So concepts from Egypt's religion, which included a robust belief in communication with the dead, spread to the Canaanite peoples. Frequently, people would attempt to talk with dead relatives and try to appease disputes that had been left unsettled when the person died. Sometimes, legal action was taken against a dead person who was thought to be interfering with a living person's affairs. Ancient Middle Eastern religions did not usually outlaw all sorcery. Hammurabi's code punished those who practiced dark and destructive magic with the death penalty. Those who practiced sorcery in order to help people were tolerated. But God strongly condemned and outlawed attempts to discover or influence the future by means of divination or astrology or witchcraft, or to manipulate people or events or the world around them by means of drugs or witchcraft or traffic with the spirit world. Why? Because it didn't work? Because it wasn't real? No. Because God requires faith from the people of God. Faith in God means trusting God with outcomes, trusting God with the future, trusting God to show us what we need, to take the right next step, whatever that is. And faith is hard. Faith means acknowledging that God is in control of a lot of things that you and I can't control, and that we're to be at peace with that. There is no supernatural power that even comes close to God's power. 
and there is no spirit being who is trustworthy in the way God is trustworthy. And of the many passages in which God spoke against these practices, here's kind of a summary. God did not say there was nothing to astrology or spiritism. What God said is that it was forbidden. The relationship God holds out to us is one of exclusivity, very like a marriage relationship. Sorcery is traffic with other spirits. It's traffic in the supernatural. It is, if you will, treachery in our exclusive relationship with God. God does say there is only one good spirit, the Holy Spirit, God's spirit for God's people. God is infinitely and eternally good, trustworthy, true, and right. All other spirits are less than that. And Satan, though disguised as beauty and light, is actually evil and dark. And Satan's spirits, demons, are darkness. God is also saying only one spiritual word is good to live by, and that is God's word, what we call the scriptures of the Bible. All other words from spiritual sources apart from God are not good and not trustworthy to live by. And finally, the whole point of trusting that God is good enough and loving enough and powerful enough and righteous enough to bring about the very best and rightest outcome in every circumstance means we're not going to try to manipulate people or circumstances especially by trying to harness the power of God's adversaries in the spiritual world. So that brings us to Saul's downward spiral. When King Saul knocked on the witch of Endor's door, he had hit rock bottom in every way. Saul knew what he was doing. He had written in his own hand the words of God's law as a young king. Now a man or a woman who is a medium or a spiritist shall surely be put to death. Saul knew that. For the person who turns to mediums and to spiritists to play the harlot after them, I will also set my face against that person and will cut him off from among his people. Saul knew that. Though God had personally selected Saul to be Israel's first king, Saul deliberately disobeyed God from early on. There came a point when the prophet Samuel told him the Lord would no longer support Saul as king. In fact, God would remove God's Holy Spirit from Saul and had already anointed another as the next king. But Saul did not accept the word of the Lord. He would not step down. He clung to the power and the palaces and the armies and the wealth that being a king gave him. And Saul did experience the departure of God's Holy Spirit. In the Holy Spirit's place came an evil spirit who appears to have tormented Saul for the rest of his life. The removal of God's Spirit left Saul to wrestle alone with the demons in his life that he had allowed for years to encroach upon him. His fear and his greed grew like a cancer, and he became ever more jealous and angry and suspicious. He succumbed to increasingly violent and erratic behavior as he repeatedly tried to get rid of David, his perceived rival. At a truly low point in Saul's story, he put to death 85 priests, because they had helped David and his men. Along with the priests, Saul destroyed the entire town of Nob, all the women, the children, even the animals. It was the point of no return for Saul. The only priest left, Abiathar, took the Urim and Thummim, the chief means for inquiring of God for wisdom and answers, and he escaped to David, who offered him sanctuary. And now the crisis came. The Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped at Gilboa. And when Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, not by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Saul somehow sensed this battle could be the end of him. But Saul, who had so often rejected God's word, now had no way to inquire of the Lord for God's word and guidance, because now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had expelled the mediums and the wizards from the land. Saul was terrified. He was desperate, and he turned to his most trusted servants. Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, so that I may go to her and inquire of her. His servant said to him, Well, 
there's a medium at Endor. And here's our first conundrum. How is she still in the land? How is it they answered so readily? How is it that they just knew her name right off the top of their heads? Saul did not hesitate, though. That very night, the king disguised himself, took two trusted men, and went to Endor, just a few miles north of where the Philistines were encamped, to consult this medium. Now, scholars and theologians have hotly disputed what happened next. Saul said, Consult a spirit for me, and bring up for me the one whom I name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and the wizards from the land. Why then are you laying a snare for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Okay, whom shall I bring up for you? And he answered, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul! The king said to her, Have no fear. What do you see? The woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up out of the ground. He said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up. He's wrapped in a robe. So Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground, and he did obeisance. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I'm in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams, so I've summoned you to tell me what I should do. Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you just as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore, the Lord has done this thing to you today. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. And immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. What really happened? Did God actually allow Samuel's spirit to appear before Saul? Or did an evil spirit come and impersonate Saul? Did the Lord send God's Holy Spirit to the Spiritist to prophesy, as God had done centuries before with Balaam? Now, the first option is really problematic, because the rest of the Bible seems to make it clear those who have died are not able to communicate with those who are still alive. But the second option also has problems, because there is no ambiguity in the passage. The text says it was Samuel. The third option is also a bit squidgy, because why would God use a device like Samuel that seems a little bit deceitful? Whatever happened, here's what we do know. Everything that was said was true. And here's what I get from that. God's word prevails in every context. Whatever happened that night, it was miraculous. God's word was spoken, and the very next day, God brought an end to Saul's reign and Saul's house and Saul's life. But that brings us to the spirit of love. You see, Israel was still living in the Bronze Age. Samuel was the last of the judges. Saul was the first of the kings. So the 12 tribes were still transitioning into becoming Israel, the landed nation. They were few in number. They were still trying to lay claim to their inheritance from God. They were still trying to drive out the indigenous population. But the Canaanite culture and their gods and their sorcery and their spiritism all seemed to have this magnetic pull on the Israelites. So when Saul banished all the spiritists and mediums in compliance with God's commands, he was banishing people who were Canaanite in origin. He was basically drawing a line in the ground between the spiritual life of the Israelite people and 
and the spiritual light of everyone else who was living in Canaan. What must that have meant for all the Canaanites living in the land among all the Israelites? I mean, these were real people with real lives, homes, farms, ranches, careers, deep family ties, sometimes ancestral ties passed from one generation to the next. Canaanite spiritists and mediums who had long been accepted in their own culture were suddenly at risk of death, as were those who came to them. And I think many must have fled in fear of their lives to the neighboring nations. Yet the witch of Endor stayed in her home. She seems to have been the head of her household and even been comfortably well off. We don't know if she had found some other way to make a living or if she continued in secret to practice her arts. What we do know from the rest of the story is that she was the kind of person who helped people, who took care of them, even at great cost to herself. The woman came to Saul and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, your servant has listened to you. I have taken my life in my hand and I've listened to what you've said to me. Now, therefore, you listen to your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you. Eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused, and he said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he got up from the ground, and he sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fatted calf in the house. She quickly slaughtered it, and she took flour, and kneaded it, and baked unleavened cakes, and she put them before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. I see her heart going out to this man who was terribly shaken and weak, even though he had put her own life in grave danger and had made himself the enemy of Almighty God. Without a second thought, she butchered her fatted calf, which normally would have been reserved only for the most special of occasions because it was very expensive. That kind of empathy and care kind of leaves me dumbfounded. I mean, here is a rejected king a man who had become more and more known for his wickedness. He's obviously an enemy of God. And yet she butchered her fatted calf for him. She baked bread without yeast. Now, just stop a minute. Unleavened bread. Agreed. She was trying to get a quick meal into the men before they left, but Saul, at least, must have seen the shadows of Passover as he ate a freshly butchered calf sacrificed for him, and unleavened bread as he strengthened himself for what was to come. I think God was saying something to Saul in that moment. Thousands of years later, the Apostle Paul explained the meaning of the unleavened bread that was always prepared for Passover celebrations. He said, Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, as you really are, unleavened. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It was Saul's very last chance to purge the leaven from his own heart, but he missed it. Then the woman set this meal before Saul and his men, and they ate. I want you to notice how she stepped back and let them eat as much as they could. She waited for the leftovers, if there were going to be any at all, before she had something to eat. Consider the ordeal that she'd been through, the crisis that she'd endured, the spirit that she'd welcomed into her home. Her life was on the line. She would have to deal with any aftermath. Her neighbors didn't know it was Saul who visited, and what might they have seen looking in her windows. But she asked nothing for herself and gave everything she could to help this doomed king. I really don't know if this woman believed in God. I don't know if she was an Israelite or a Canaanite. I don't know if she had converted from her spiritist days or what. But what I do know is that she got love right. And if you have put your faith in God, then let me tell you, that's the one thing you and I have got to get right. As Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I've loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Apostle Paul later echoed Jesus' teaching in his letter to the believers in Corinth. 
It's a famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. The greatest proof of having the Holy Spirit is not a spiritual gift. It's spiritual fruit, love. The greatest evidence and power of God is love for people. When those who are not believers out love God's own people, that should give us pause. What are we as believers known for then? Here's what I hope we can be known for, the preeminence of love. Any spiritual gift that's exercised without love, according to Paul, is no better than the worship of idols. Prophecy, knowledge, faith, sacrificial giving, even martyrdom is completely useless and empty without love. That's what he says. The perfection of love, true love comes from the heart. Not only do you and I act outwardly patient and kind, but we really are on the inside. Why? Because we have God's Holy Spirit who is love. We don't just hold our tongue because we're keeping all the rudeness and selfishness and anger and grudges inside. Instead, because we are continually repenting and continually being refilled with the Spirit and continually being cleansed by that great river of life flowing through us, you and I are the genuine article. This is totally impossible without the Holy Spirit, but with Jesus, all things, even this is possible. And then finally, the permanence of love. Because the nature God has given us is God's own nature. And God is love. One day, you and I will no longer need faith and we won't need hope because we'll have arrived. But we will have love forever. Oh Lord God, I'm so thankful to you for having preserved this story, this strange story in Paul's life because you have shown us through a woman whose name we don't even know, who did things that were in direct violation of you, of your command, and yet she did love. And God, we feel it too, that we who also violate your commands must get love right. Please help us. Please fill us afresh with a new revelation of your love and your light. And we pray it so that we may become more like you. To the praise of your grace. Amen. Thank you.